His followers cried rivers of tears. Soldiers led him away. Darkness came upon the land. Jesus already knew his blood, the price he was to pay. Suffering stripes, he shouldered the cross. Wore a crown of thorns, Lamb of God was sacrificed unto Calvary. As all creation mourned, His promise was complete. The chosen watch, salvation being born. For he has risen. The angel's voice was heard. Do not be afraid. See where the Lord of glory lay. He has risen from the grave. On his own power, by his grace, the world was saved. For he has risen. Good morning, family. If it's your first time with us, then welcome and happy Easter, or as we like to call it, Resurrection Sunday. We have a month full of festivities to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Make sure to join us today right after service for our extravaganza Easter egg helicopter drop for the kids and much more. Next Sunday is our Orthodox Easter service, Sunday morning, April 16th at 10 a.m., followed by a family fun day and food right after the service. Also plan on a family fun day on April 30th, immediately following 10 a.m. service. Details coming soon. Wow, we sure know how to celebrate our Lord at the City of Destiny, and all events are free. We do print tickets though, so you can invite other friends and family, so be sure to pick some up in our lobby today. Attention teenagers, remember immediately following praise and worship today, we'll be called back to the lobby to go to our own youth service just for us middle and high schoolers. One of the leaders will lead us to our own message and fellowship with other teens our age. What else is coming up, Mom? Well, our next men's fellowship is coming up next week, Tuesday night, April 18th at 7 p.m. Guys, come out and hang with your brothers to fellowship and get deeper with God. Remember, it's every other Tuesday night. Contact the church office or Pastor Ryan for details. That about wraps it up for now. We'll see you back this Wednesday night at 7 p.m. for our midweek Bible study and praise and worship. Happy Easter, everyone. God bless you.
let's let's not play any longer oh we know why we're here this morning let's rise to our feet we're here to glorify for the risen savior the lamb who was slain for the sins of the world he has risen and we're here to give him glory and honor thank you father god happy resurrection look to your neighbor and say happy resurrection online family i'm so glad and grateful you're able to tune in next year make it here 505 east mccormick road god bless you let's get started you guys look so beautiful this morning <laughs> everyone clap your hands
church. I just, I need everyone to sing this out. It's, it's a beautiful day, and we're here to celebrate a day that gave us life right now. Hey, no one, no way. No one, no way. Look at your neighbor and say, no one, no way.
that's your testimony, just lift up the name of Jesus. The name above all names, Jesus. The one that saved us, Jesus, 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 Jesus. What amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. back for a purpose to conquer hell death in the grave but 40 days later he ascended and he blessed the disciples and all of mankind forevermore by breathing on us the Holy Spirit and so this morning we want to declare blessing upon God's people so just with every hand lifted across the sanctuary let's be in a mind to receive from our Holy Father
favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children be his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations And your family and your children and their children and their children May his favor be upon you in a thousand generations And your family and your children next to you and say you look marvelous and looking today nobody has to lie because you all look fantastic thank you so much for being with us you may take a seat for those of you watching online thank you a thousand thank yous for being with us today 
Today's the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice. We're going to be glad in it. We're going to prepare ourselves to take up the offering here in a, a quick second. But as you know, Minister John is on tour uh, with Journey. Uh, those of you who don't know, Pastor Paula husband is Jonathan Kane of Journey. He's the keyboardist. He's the one that wrote, Don't Stop Believing Faithfully, Open Arms. Well, he's on tour with Journey, so he's unable to be here right now. But he wanted to send a little message to you. So let's take a look at the screen. Hi, family. This is Minister John reaching out from the road. I just want to say happy Resurrection Sunday to all of you and want to thank you for your prayers. We're nearly done with this tour um, in Springfield. Right now I'm heading to Wichita tomorrow. I'm going to be watching online. Um, thank you for supporting our ministry. Of course, my lovely wife, Pastor Paula White Kane, her son, Pastor Brad, Pastor Todd, everyone that works so hard, all, all of you. Uh, I miss you, I love you, and just want to say he has risen. Hallelujah, he has risen. Amen. That doesn't get any better than that. Minister John, we love you. We know that you are our missionary to the rock and roll world. Amen. And so, and that was some good looking hair you had up there too, boss man. Just want to let you know, you look great. Well, he is risen. This is where you say he is risen indeed. All right. You didn't think the Baptist boy knew that, did you? But he did. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, thank you so much for being here. We're going to take up God's tithe and our offering here. And thank you for giving. Thank you for the way that you financially support this ministry. Those of you who are here, those of you who watch online, we can't do it without you. In fact, this week alone, we fed over 24,000 meals from this property right here. Just under 30,000 pounds of food. Another $17,000 worth of, of brand new furniture came into our warehouse this week alone, making it in the first three months, $1.3 million worth of brand new home furnishings that we've been able to give out to the community. So when you make your check payable to City of Destiny or you do cash app or text to give, however it is you, those of you here will be putting it on the altar here in a moment. I want you to know that it goes to help people. You see, people, before they need to get into a church, they need to know that the church cares. Would you agree with that? And this church cares. This church is the most giving church I've ever seen in my entire life. And that's because you give. So thank you for that. Next week, see, most of you don't know this. You're going to learn something new here. Do you know there's two Resurrection Sundays? We have an Orthodox Easter, which is next Sunday. So we're going to make a special Sunday next Sunday. Now, listen to what I'm saying. Today, for the children, for the children, we are going to have a helicopter Easter egg drop. All right. And if you're older than a child and you need to get in there and mix it up, those four-year-olds are pretty tough. I'm just telling you. I don't know if I'd want to go there. But next week, everyone say next week. Next week, we are going to have a carnival out there. I mean, it is going to be a family fun day. So you come, you bring people with you, and we're going to learn about the Orthodox Easter that we'll celebrate next Sunday with Pastor Brad. So you want to be here. We're going to make it fun. It's going to be a great time. Make sure you get family pictures out in the foyer. Today's a great day. Would you agree with that? Without today, everything that we do in the name of Jesus is meaningless if there wasn't a resurrection. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for giving. I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to stand to your feet as we prepare God's tithe. Romans 8.11 says, 
the Spirit of God that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. Let that sink in for a moment. The power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you, lives inside of me. When we place our faith and our trust in him, and you're gonna be able to, to experience that love today as Pastor Paula preaches the word to you today. But because his spirit is in us, that power, it gives us the ability, the faith to be able to do things that we're about to do right now, to give God his tithe, to, for us to give an offering, and maybe even a, a little special, I love you, Jesus, because you're alive from the dead offering. I don't know. A little extra, as we say, a little extra something, something in the soup. God's so worthy of it, amen. Thank you for giving. It allows us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for being so good to us. Thank you, Father, for meeting our needs. Thank you, Father, for the way that you just continually meet every need that we have. Thank you, Father, for the way that our people give here in the sanctuary and throughout the internet and on the airwaves, God. Because it allows us to be able to meet the needs of people, whether it's putting food in hungry stomachs or whether it's furnishing the homes of single moms or those that need some help. I just pray, God, that you would continue to use us in the lives of people. Thank you for everyone that's here. Thank you for our special guests. And Father, may you bless them for being a blessing to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's come forward. Amen. Thank you so much for everyone giving generously. If this is your first time to City of Destiny, we welcome you. Um, we're excited about what God is doing, and we love you. We thank God for all of our online givers. As you want to go to cityofdestiny.us and give a generous love offering. If this is your first time, just lift up your hands so we can welcome you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Looking beautiful. Good to have everyone here. I want to ask everybody to stand up on their feet for a moment. Maybe just get up, greet somebody around you, say hello, introduce yourself. And um, I'm going to read a testimony as they continue to give. says, Pastor Paul, I sent a prayer request to you. It had many needs. In the last 12 months, I'd lost my marriage. Two family members died. My finances were in ruin and many bad things had happened. I was a very broken person, but I had requested prayer from many Christian sites, hoping God's people would pray for me. So I got quite a few responses via email. During my weekly email purge, I noticed Pastor Paula White's email. The prayers Pastor Paula sent to me caused my gratefulness to God to pour out on me and the tears begin to flow. I got deliverance. I got breakthrough. I'm so grateful to God. My broken heart is healed. Thank you for your prayers. God bless you all. City of Destiny, Paula White Ministry, Cindy of Linwood, Washington. Come on and put your hands together. God's a healer of the broken heart. Pastor Brad, Pastor Rachel, I'm going to ask you just to come up really quick because we have so many people that are here for the first time. And if you don't know everybody just standing up, this is Pastor Brad, Pastor Rachel. Um, he is my son and daughter-in-law. Come on, but they are also pastors of Story Life. So City of Destiny is a bigger, bigger, it's the services, the community. We're building out an entire city here. Can you see it with us? And in September, Story Life will officially launch as the church that is here as part of the city with Pastors Brad and Rachel on September the 3rd. I'm still going to be preaching. Come on, Pastor Brad's going to be preaching. We're going to be ministering. We're growing exponentially. Welcome, Pastor Brad. Say a few things. Welcome them back for next week. You'll be preaching, and um, he's a phenomenal man of God. I just wanted to introduce you. You've got a magazine. It tells all about what's happening here at Story Life City of Destiny and Paula White Ministry. Greet the people, and then I'm going to preach. <laughs> he's risen. He is risen. I woke up with joy 
knowing death is defeated and that whatever is coming against you, it's already lost because our God conquered death, hell, and the grave. Amen. My kids are excited. I'm excited about what God's doing as we build out this city. I mean, this is something that's gonna last decades and decades and decades, generations. It's generational blessings, and I'm grateful to be a part of it. It's exciting. Uh, I just wanna say thank you for coming. Uh, and as I was driving here today, I had to drive through South of Popka. It's quite a walk. It's good. It's good. I was driving to church. I was watching people walk to crack houses. And I was, I used to be in a crack house. And I was hurrying to church and I saw this little girl with her head down walking. And I thought, like, I got to stop. I should get out. If I could give her a hundred dollars, maybe get in a car and bring her to church, she might have some life. She might have some hope. Yeah. And I thought, man, I'm so glad I'm going to church, but we've got to do more than church. Yeah. We've got to be more than church. And those of you who are here, you're here because you know there's life here. Yeah. You're here because you, you believe it for yourself or you're here because your mama brought you or your daddy brought you. And whether you believe it because of them or not, they gave you life. They gave you life. And you're where life is. And I'm excited about all the things that we're going to build. I'm excited about story life. I'm excited about the church. I'm excited about us coming together. But we're the carriers of life. You don't have to come here to experience the presence of God. God is in you. And so when we come here, yeah, I want to encourage you not just to have a good Easter Sunday, but to take this resurrection life and this hope and this truth that you encounter today and take it back out there with you. Because we get stuck in our way of thinking. We come to church, we hurry up, and there's people that are dying on Easter Sunday. There's people who are dying this very hour as we celebrate our life. There are people out there dying. And I just want to encourage you not to take this lightly because this is life and death. This is real. This is everything. And you and you alone who are here today have the answer. You and you alone. Amen. Grab the person's heck next to you. We're going to pray and then we're going to preach the word and God is going to move. He said that he's going to heal people today. He's going to save people today. He's going to deliver people today. He's going to give you direction today. You had to be here. God brought you here. You might have thought, well, I thought I'd do the right thing, the Sunday thing, the Easter thing, but God's the one that ordained for you to be here. And as you hear, we are a church that believes in the power of God, the presence of God. We believe in getting outside of the four walls and taking the gospel to the community, first to our Jerusalem, and then ultimately to the uttermost parts of the world. But it starts with you. Hold that hand. Squeeze that hand right now. Just squeeze it. I want you to do it. I want that person that you're holding that hand to know that they feel that because you're holding the hand of a miracle right now. See, you're holding the hand of a miracle because had the enemy had his way, he would have wiped that person out they should have been buried six feet under they should not be in their right mind they should not have made it to an Easter Sunday service at City of Destiny but God somehow some way God intervened squeeze that hand right now because you have no idea what that person is going through the battles they're facing the home they have to go back to the heart that is broken the head that is messed up and confused but today I believe you're gonna have a divine encounter with a real God a true God a life-giving God come on a love God a God that gave his only begotten son so you could have life that's actually a world changers hand you're holding God has a plan for you he has a purpose for you you're not an accident you're not a coincidence you're not here by mistake but an almighty God a sovereign God planned you purpose you found you fashioned you and set you here to set you on course today father in the name which is above every name I can do nothing I am nothing I can say nothing but I yield myself to you right now Holy Spirit speak through me let your power let your presence be here let us leave this place knowing that we encountered you oh God break off every chain of bondage 
begin to work on hearts right now. Turn the, the hardened ground to, to soft ground, God, and let the word, your seed, fall on good ground today. Let angels show up from the north, south, east, the west. I call on you. I summon you. Let your power, let the Holy Spirit move mightily. I thank you from center to circumference. Your glory is in this house. And we leave here saying, wasn't it good to be in the house of God? We met with God. We were changed. We were transformed by a living God who is not dead, but he is truly risen in Jesus name the only name the name above every name the name above cancer the name above death the name above hell the name above the grave the name above torment the name above confusion the name above depression the name above suicide let the name of Jesus be exalted not only here but around this world today with everyone watching I pray over you right now in Jesus mighty name and everybody said amen come on and put your hands together with the big Biggest praise you've given God. God is faithful. He's good all the time. Turn to somebody say, you look better than you usually do. Just say, I, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Say, you look good today and you truly do. You can be seated in the presence of God. I want to expound on the gospel. Today, the Lord gave me one word to minister. Hope. Hope. Look at somebody say, hope. A wise person once said that we can live about 40 days without food, about three days without water, about eight minutes without air, but not a single second without hope. Where there is no hope in the future, there is no power in the present. When we really begin to think about it, there are people sitting here and you look beautiful today. You look good. The outside seems right. But I believe there are people here that have given up. They don't look like it, but they've given up on experiencing real love in their marriage. They've given up and feel like that drug addicted child will never live a normal life. They believe that America is not recoverable from its abomination of sins. There are people that don't even want to apply for another job because they don't want to get up and go to work. They stay up at night worried, have anxiety, fears, real fears, living week to week, paycheck to paycheck a half empty heart, concerned about things that they can never even control, thinking that somehow they can make life work. You see, when a spouse loses hope, they give up on their marriage. When parents lose hope, they give up on their teens. When citizens lose hope, they give up on their nation. When leaders lose hope, they give up on their people. And Proverbs chapter 13, verse 11 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. There are a lot of hearts that are sick in our society today. Statistics show us loudly, blaringly, glaringly, how sick of a society we really are. Now, John got me a cute dress and I can put a dress on top of something, but it can still be sick inside. You can put a smile and a Facebook pose and an Instagram post on top of a very ill, diseased, sick soul. People are hurting. We're in some difficult times in many ways. When you look recently, the Wall Street Journal and many different polls, but they released a poll that was actually staggering to my heart. It was just the confirmation of what Pastor Brad and all of us drive by every day. And not just in South Apopka, in Windermere, in Kissimmee, in Orlando, in Winter Garden, in the most affluent neighborhoods and the most broken ones. The poll said that 39% of Americans say religion is important to them. 
That sounds really good until you recognize that it's down from 62% who said that faith was very important to them just 25 years ago. In 1998, when Without Walls and Paula White Ministry was at the, the beginning, the genesis, and Without Walls was at its going into its height. It was packed out with people on Easter. We would fill out the stadium there at the Ice Palace, 18,000 people, and not have room and have to turn away 20,000. Because everybody, what would Jesus do? Being a Christian was not difficult during those days. There was a longing for God and a hunger for God. They say that 38% say that patriotism is very important to them. Down from 70% who it was important to in 1998. This one's staggering. They say that 30% saying that, say that raising children, 30% say that raising children is important to them down from 59 percent just 25 years ago only a third of americans believe that raising a child and valuing anything that we say life is even important today we discard our children like we do our trash you see what people have lost is something that's so unfamiliar to me with my walk with god people have lost hope in god They've lost hope in this country and they've lost hope in families. That makes us a sick society. When you lose hope in God, when you lose hope in your fellow citizen and man and lose hope in your family, that's a hurting heart. You see, without hope, there is no life force that keeps us going and gives us something to live for. And I would dare to say with what we've all gone through the last several years from a global pandemic to transition after transition, to job layoffs, to everything changing, to all uh, time high suicide rates and divorce rates. And we'll go into a little bit of that. No wonder even people here will feel some area of hopelessness, but get outside of this building and it will be staggering what people will feel. See, stats show us glaringly that we've become a people of little hope, Minister Greg. The CDC released something and I said, man, I, I would quit all the ministry I know and go back to just raising up the greatest children's ministry. It's how I started. It's all I did was preach on the street to little boys and girls with a bullhorn and tell them that Jesus loved them and there's hope for them. Because the CDC recently released that 30% of teenage girls daily have suicidal thoughts and want to take their life. 30%. Up 60% from a decade ago. It means your daughter and your son who don't know how to talk to you. One out of three of them don't want to live anymore. Don't see any reason to live. In 2022, the Mental Health America data says that 11.4 million adults have serious suicidal thoughts, not depression. They want to take their life up 664,000 from last year. We have sick hearts and hope deferred makes the heart sick. 37,309,000 Americans aged 12 years and older do illegal drugs every single day. It's not accounting for what is legal, what's out of the pill box. And here's something that was one of the most profound things that's gonna be a crux of what I'm teaching today. Someone once said, discouragement is the anesthetic the devil uses on a person just before he reaches in and carves out his heart. It's a profound statement. It's worth you hearing it over and over that discouragement is the anesthetic that the devil uses on a person before he reaches in and carves out his heart. There are people that live next door to you that work in a cubicle right by you that shop at the same place, eat at the right or same restaurant and they have deep discouragement. I just showed it to you. You see, what begins to happen when you lose hope, you lose your ability to dream for the future, to believe for a better day tomorrow. Despair replaces joy. Fear replaces faith. Anxiety replaces prayer. 
and insecurity replaces confidence. And here's the thing, we're not the first people that are grappling with this dire dilemma. I wanna take you back just a few thousand years. When God chose to send his son, Jesus Christ, into the earth, the timing that he did it, there was great political and social and economic unrest. And even more so, he sent him right into the very epicenter of tyranny and turmoil. You see, as a young baby, when Jesus was born in that lowly manger because they all had to go pay their, do the census and pay their dues and all the other things that were taking place. And you know, he's born in a manger, but, but Herod, the ruler, the king, the person, the prime minister, the president, the man who was in charge, Herod had heard that this child was born and he was vexed by it. So the Bible declares that he would do mass infanticide and kill every male child under the year of two years old. But in a dream, the Lord would speak to Joseph and he would take Jesus with Mary and he would flee down to Egypt where he would live for a safe refugee and God would have him in hiding. You see, Herod was so wicked and evil. He claimed deity and he would rather kill a generation than God bring forth the deliverer. Doesn't sound much different than some of our days. They were dark times. Jesus would return, you know, sometime before he was 12 years old, where he would be in the temple confounding the scholars. 12 years old. He'd start his public ministry at 30 years old down at the River Jordan, which is the lowest place in the earth because God takes you from low places. I don't care how low you are today. And he takes you to high places in him. He takes you from broken places to places that are repaired, to places that are filled. And Jesus would start his ministry in the lowest place on earth saying something to us that it doesn't matter where you start. It doesn't matter where you come from. For those of you that don't know my story, my father committed suicide when I was five years old. I didn't grow up in church. I was sexually and physically abused from the age of six to 13. Our economic status went up and down. Sometimes there was food. Sometimes I was fighting with my brother over a bowl of spaghetti. It didn't matter where I was born or who I was born into or what happened to me as a young child. When I was 18 years old, I heard the truth that you'll hear today. And when I heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, I said yes, and my life was radically changed like yours will be today. Jesus started in a low place and the heavens opened the dove descends, which is representative of the Holy Spirit. The Father's voice resounds, this is my son whom I am well pleased. You know what happens from there. He goes into the wilderness for 40 days. He's tempted, but he passes that temptation hungry. He comes out in the power. And you would think like he would go have some mass crusade at this time. He starts picking his 12 chosen disciples, his tribe, his homeboys. The ones who are going to change the world with them. And you know, they would walk with them and talk with them. And it seems like things are going to a little bit better from the days of Herod and mass infanticide. Because Jesus starts picking these dudes, Peter and Andrew and James and John and all of their radical stories and craziness. I'm so glad that God shows it to us. A hot-headed Peter. Come on, I'm so glad that God shows us everyone because it tells me I can be in the posse. I can be part of the family. And they would watch Jesus as he would absolutely disrupt the, disrupt the religious system upside down, confronting and turning it inside out, confronting the Sadducees and the Pharisees, confounding them. They saw the miracles and miracles are still for today. He's a miracle working God. There would be 35 recorded miracles. If you need a miracle, God will give you a miracle today. I promise you. He turns water into wine. That's a pretty cool one to start. Hill's a noble man's son. He provides a great catch of fish for Simon Peter. He, he delivers a demoniac from the synagogue. He heals Peter's wife 
his mother from an illness with this fever that is about to take her life. He cleanses a leper, a person that was not allowed in society, a reject, a person that, that was uh, condemned. Maybe you've been rejected by the norm. Maybe you've been condemned by your family. But God says, I accept you and I cleanse you and I change you and I transform you. you he, he, the friends of this man cut down the roof because they wanted him to get to Jesus so bad. Can we have friends like that? People who will take you to Jesus that they're willing to disrupt everything and cut a hole in the roof and he heals a paralytic and the paralytic who could not walk, could not do it anything is able to walk come on he's a miracle working God he raises a widow's son from the dead because God will raise dead things he will raise dead life he'll raise dead dreams come on he'll raise you literally physically from the dead he's a miracle working God there is nothing that is too difficult for God whatever you are facing today whatever you're going through today I send a miracle to it in the name of Jesus I send a miracle to your situation that son who's rebellious Come on, the prodigal son will come to himself today in the name of Jesus. That daughter that doesn't know God, get ready because God's about to transform your family. You came here believing maybe, like the woman with the issue of blood, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, he changes, he does miracles, and immediately she was healed, the Bible said. He fed 4,000 people. He fed 5,000 people. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He heals blind Bartimaeus. Emmaus he gives you sight you came in here and you couldn't see anything oh you could see with these but you couldn't see with this eye you couldn't see with your spirit and God will open up your eye he'll open up your ears to hear he's a miracle working God come on he replaces Malthus's ear when Peter gets hot tempered and cuts it off he walks on water he delivers and heals the Syrophoenician girl he heals a deaf and dumb man he provides money in the fish's mouth to pay the tax Taxes. Come on. God's even got your tax bill before the 15th, the 18th, whenever you got to pay it. God is a provider. God is a healer. God is a deliverer. God is life. God is a transformer. God is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore, according to Hebrews chapter 13. And he's no respecter of persons. What he did then, he'll still do today. He's a miracle working God. It was getting pretty good. Can you imagine? 35 recorded miracles and the Bible says and the volumes could not tell at all if it was written God you know those good times help those bad times kind of go away and the disciples of Jesus they're living and loving life with Jesus right now oh I know that feeling like you're so full of God you think nothing can go wrong Nothing can touch us now. And they would have prayer times with him. He would go away and pray with them. They would be on the Mount of Transfiguration, see Moses and Elijah come, vacations, ministry, feeding the poor, freeing people. They would go and watch him when this woman was caught in the very act of adultery, say, you who have no sin, cast the first stone, with every one of them dropping it down, telling you and I that he'll get down in the dirty places and he'll, he'll wipe away everything that is condemning us. I mean, the woman at the well who'd been married five times, he uses as his greatest evangelist. And she goes into a city and converts the whole city. The woman who's bound in a synagogue church and she's bound and she can't know why. She had no ability to lift herself up. Woman, thou art loosed and immediately she straightens. The recognition that he indeed is the Messiah, Matthew 16, 15 and 17. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Now it is feast season. They're going to Jerusalem for the Passover. Two and a half million Jews. You know what? We just celebrated Palm Sunday. They don't know it's Palm Sunday yet, but you know the story? That they, they are fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9, and Jesus chooses to enter in on a donkey. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, and a colt and a fowl of a donkey. They, they believe it. Now there are millions of Jews and they believe that this is the Messiah. And so as they go in, they, they line the streets with their cloaks. 
and they're seeing the Word of God fulfilled. And they take the palm branches and they begin to cry out, Hosanna, Son of David, which means save now. You're the Messiah. And they believed that He was the Messiah, that He would truly deliver them from the tyrannical forces that were oppressing them. And they had thought, and this is important, I can imagine, Pastor Brad, that they're thinking, finally, justice has come. Finally. And it had, Dr. Paul, just not in the way that they thought it would play out. And sometimes such it is with our life. We, we, we are in this time that like almost globally, it's as if people have just lost so much hope. And then you get these moments that are momentous. Well, maybe we're past the days of Herod. Maybe this is the turning point. Maybe this is the revival that we've all been praying for and believing God for. They were sure the Messiah was going to overthrow the Roman government and bring forth the kingdom he'd been preaching about. And then, almost overnight, everything changed. Have you ever been there? Where your whole world changes overnight. It often leaves you with a place that you're left to pick up the pieces and don't even know how to. You cry when you look back, Pastor Brad, 20 years because you still remember the feeling of the Brillo pad and not wanting to be in a situation of a crack addict, but not knowing how to really get out. No one goes into something thinking it will destroy their life. In just days, these disciples would encounter the bleakest recorded day of all history, which would shatter any hope that they have. Discouragement seems so elementary for the fierce feelings I could imagine these disciples would rapidly descend to. They'll be filled with despair and fear and will even go into hiding. They had believed, they had believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah. And now their hope is shattered. And such is it with us. When we believe that person's gonna live and make it. When we believe our marriage is gonna be a certain way. When we believe our children, when we believe the pastor, and there are certain things that will cause us to have shattering to our heart and to our hope. They had forgotten those promises that he'd given them in that moment, because when you have that kind of trauma, your brain doesn't even work right. They had forgotten God's promise in their despair, when they were free, afraid, when they were hiding. Discouragement is the anesthesia the devil uses just before he reaches in and carves out your heart. If he can get you discouraged long enough, if he can get you discouraged strong enough, it's just the anesthetic before he can take your heart. I remind you Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promises faithful. You see, Lynette, it's easy for one of us or two of us, and I'm making it very cadent like this today, to say amen, but it's hard to hold when you're hurting. For the five of you that wanna be real with me, I spent the majority of my life in the presence of God. And 19 life crisis hit me within a three year period that shook me to the core of my faith that I thought if this isn't real, my family, what I perceived as ministry, God, 
what is real that I know about you. Now I know for those of you who are super saints and don't suffer in your humanity, God is just always a perfect Santa Claus to you, but he hasn't been to me. Not that anything was wrong with him, but I couldn't find him in my depression. I hurt so bad you watched me waste away 30 pounds less than I am right now. 30 pounds less. Couldn't eat, wanted to eat. Couldn't sleep, wanted to sleep. Couldn't pick myself up, wanted to pick myself up. I hurt. Kristen had cancer, Brad was a crack addict, Randy was having multiple affairs, the ministry was falling apart, we were being, being tackled in the media, lied on under investigation. Every area of my life was being rocked by what I thought and who I thought and how I thought God had called me and who He was. I wish I could tell you that your Christian watch is gonna be, hey, I get saved and everything is great. There's an end to this story, and I've got you about three-fourths there. It's hard to hold on when you really hurt. It's hard to even pray for yourself when you really hurt. You see, I'm not just to hold on to anything. I'm to hold on to hope. No, 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 wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Because one thing you'll find out about this ministry is we're authentic. I'm not talking about holding on to the two or three scriptures you can quote. I'm talking about holding on to something so deep within that when everything doesn't make sense, you still have it. Yeah. By the end of today, that's what's going to hit you. By the end of the day, this is not hopeful wishing. This is not some high expectation that you can go through seven steps. I don't know if you're gonna go through 30 steps or no steps. I don't even know how many steps there are. I don't think there is a formula. I just think there's an ever presence living God who will go and make his bed in hell with you and who will stick closer to you than a brother and he'll never forsake you and he'll never leave you and he'll be with you when you fall down not one time but on the sixth time and on the seventh time and he'll keep saying, Here's my hand, hold it, Paula. Here's my heart, love it, Paula. Here I am, I'm not giving up. Don't give up on me. You see, biblical hope is forward-looking faith. And it's hard to look ahead when something hits you so hard from behind. Dr. John, biblical hope is a confident belief not based on things that are experienced based truly on his word <laughs> that, the, that he says the future I promised will happen you see hope in the Greek is elpis or elpo two different words off the same one which means to anticipate with pleasure to have an expectation to anticipate or welcome the expectation that something is certain you see, we know without faith it is impossible to please God, and faith is belief, it's the peace tease. It's impossible not to please, like make Him happy, but to be in agreement with God. But hope is the cousin to faith. They're the inseparable partners. Because faith believes it will, but hope anticipates its arrival. That's hard, unless you really get past this Friday. The Thayer's lexicon says, that in which one confines or which he flees or takes refuge, hope is a desired accompanied, a desire that is accompanied by expectation, belief or fulfillment. And I promise you the devil will mess so hard with your mind to rock your hope. I promise you he will, almost in a tormenting way. Like the disciples, I believe that maybe you've come in here today or someone's watching with a heavy heart, a confused conscience, a shattered soul. It didn't go down the way that you thought it should. And now, if we're honest, 
Maybe you're afraid, afraid to love again, afraid to trust again, afraid to open yourself up again, afraid to commit again, afraid to surrender again, afraid to walk like that again. And why not? Because Good Friday felt really bad. Oh, see, we're here. It's easy now, but I've got to let you absorb it. Dr. Paul, we know the end of the story. So I'm trying to pause their mind from judgment of getting to where you already know the stone is rolled away. Ah, there's a catch. No, most of us are stuck in Good Friday. If you didn't hear Pastor Brad's message, go back and, re and hear it. It's the most absurd thing that this is the emblem of victory. You go, why? I'm about to tell you. Because it's the cruelest, most sickening punishment and death that could have been invented by humanity. I think it's necessary for the next 15 minutes to go through the text, the word, the scripture, the process so you don't stay stuck in disappointment with just this occasional hopeful wishing. But truly, if by the grace of God, hope can hit you. Oh, by the way, I failed to give you the title of today's Easter Sunday. Hope has arrived. The Lord told me to tell you, hope has arrived. I don't know what your dark Friday is, but let me talk to you for a moment. I don't assume that everyone knows the gospel of Jesus Christ or the crux of Christianity. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21 and 22 tells us the end. The apostle Paul expounds afterwards, for as by man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Long before the end, the ultimate victory of life in Christ, there were many parts to this process. They were hard to understand, much less endure for those that were facing real time events like his disciples. Can I take you through it in about 20 minutes? Say, bring it on, Pastor Paula. In John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus grabs one more breath and he says, it is finished. Oh, see, we think we know it. Close your eyes and go there with me. In the Greek, it means completed. It means executed. It means concluded. It means he discharged a debt. It would not be a cry of defeat, but it would be a cry of victory. The war had been won. God had a plan for man all along before you were ever a twinkle in your mama's eye and before your mom and daddy went to Motel 6. God had a plan for you. He had a plan for their plight. He had a plan for their destruction. He had a plan for their disease. He had a plan for our poverty. He had a plan for our provision. He had a plan for our salvation. He declared in Revelation chapter 21, verse six, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He is Christ Pentocrator. He is the Lord of hosts. It's a word you need to know. He is the one who has the last word. The God who is in control regardless of the situation or the circumstance. He is the almighty one and the powerful one. He is the sustainer of the world. I promise you, if anything went out of whack, this whole earth right now and our existence, the breath in your body is because Jesus holds all things together. It is because of his amazing grace and his all sufficient love. He sent his son Jesus Christ, divinity wrapped in humanity to save their people from their sins. In John chapter 14, verse six, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Muhammad is still dead. Confucius is still dead. Come on, Buddha never was alive. It's a religion. <laughs> Come on, Jesus Christ is the only one that is alive and risen. 
His name, which means Jehovah, salvation, is God's instrument to save. He is the Christ. The Greek word means Messiah. The Hebrew means the anointed one. He is the anointed Messiah. He declared at Calvary, it is finished. He, his plan included not to just to save you, to rescue you, to redeem you, but to heal you, to restore you. Come on, everything. It's an all-inclusive plan. In 1 Peter 1:19, it says, He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ. You weren't bought with silver and gold but by the blood of Jesus, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. God chose him for the purpose long before the world began, but only recently was he brought into public view in these last hours as a blessing. You say, what kind of blessing is he to me? Romans chapter five, verse 12 declares, wherefore as by one man, sin entered into the whole world and by death and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for everyone sinned. Don't let your neighbor fool you. They, they, they might have slept with 32 people last week and you might not have ever put your hand in the cookie jar, but you both are guilty. You both are guilty. You say, no, it's only a few of you clapping. All right, I promise you, guilty was the verdict. Guilty was the verdict. Oh my, please don't make me preach hard right here because sin means to miss the mark and to fall short of the character of God. We all miss the mark. We've all fallen short of the character. And Romans chapter three, verse 10 says, as it is written, there's none that are righteous. There are none that were in right standing. No, not one. God did not determine to leave you that way. The Bible says that the son of man came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to put you back in position. You don't have to leave here misaligned. You don't have to leave here out of position. Now hope is getting ready to come. This is the day that hope arrives in your life. You see Romans 6 23 says the wage is the sin of death. And it says, but, the, but with God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But here's the question, why? Why, X, would God do it? It's love, X. It's love. Play one of those love songs. There you go. It's, there you go. Yeah, yeah, they just went right back to the club on that one. It's John 3, 16 and 17. See, uh, you needed that to be reminded what you were doing in the club to that song. Oh, y'all start going, oh, baby. Some of y'all got, Stella just got a groove back on real quick. John 3, 16 and 17, it was God's love. For God so greatly, keep playing it, X, go on. So greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he gave up his only begotten son. That so whosoever believes in him, trusts and clings to, relies on him, shall not perish, come to destruction or be lost, but have eternal everlasting life. For God did not send the son into the world in order to judge, to reject, to condemn, to pass sentence on the world, but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. You know, the desperate part, don't get mad. Don't get mad at the liberals or the conservatives. Don't get mad at the independents or the Democrats or the Republicans. It's not their fault. They're like, whoa, don't get mad. They just don't know. If they ever knew the salvation of God, that God came to give us a safe world, that God came to make us safe and sound through him. Don't get mad at the person who's hating on you on your job. Don't get mad at that person that's lying about you on the internet. Don't get mad at that person who's slandering you or hurting you. Come on, you have something that they don't because you understand this love, this grace, th this God that that loved you beyond what you could ever imagine came to make you safe and sound that no word that they speak could actually take you out or hurt you that bad come on the only way this world heals is by understanding the love of an almighty God that is so much greater than any of our little individual hang-ups 
He said that in Romans 5, 8, God commanded that love towards us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That he would find salvation through death. I just lost some of you at Democrats and Republicans. I see it. It's okay. You'll come back. Because this is not a political battle. This is not a natural battle. This is a devil battle. This is an entity that is far beyond human. That hates what God loves. And God so loves you. It says that we would find salvation through his death. Think about that. Hebrews 12, 2, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Help me out, Derek. Help me show it. He hated the shame and pain, but he endured. He'd stand firm under the pressure. Why? For the joy that was set before him. The joy that there would be an Eli. The joy that, that there would be a Clayton. The joy that it was set before him, that he would not leave you in despair. He would not leave you separated or isolated, not in this life and not in the everlasting life. He endured the cross for you and for I. You see, there's nothing pretty about this. And I'm gonna preach it for about 10 minutes here, but it started long before Calvary. The epic encounter of eternity will take place not on a battlefield, not on a canvas, nor in a valley of violence, but it will take place on an old rugged cross it's still the emblem of suffering and shame oh we make it look pretty we put it around our necks on our ears everywhere else we gold it up we platinum it up we do everything but we find jesus victory in the most unlikely place on the last day of passover that thursday they would go into this place called garden of gethsemane it means the all pray press it would be where Jesus would start getting pressed more than he'd ever been before. John 18, 2, he often resorted there with his disciples. It was a getaway place. It was a pleasant place. 18, 1 says, behold the Kidron Valley. It means a place of obscurity, a place of darkness, because this would become a dark place. This would become a place where the God man wrestles with the God will. What drove him to pursue? Matthew 26, 38, he said to them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful. It means he was grieving so much that it was to a point of death. Play that depressing music now. It's sad, depressed. He's grieving, seriously, he's hurting. His soul is exceeding sorrowful. And he says, tarry here to three of his disciples, watch with me. And in Luke 22, 44, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as if it were great drops of blood. He's praying to the Father and he's under such pressure for the weight of the world is now on him that he literally begins to suffer from this condition called hemidrosis where the small capillaries in, in, his, in his head begin to burst and, and blood begins to come through his sweat, through his, through his pores there. And he's under this extreme pressure. The Bible says he was in great agony. It means a contest that was held, a place of assembly, a struggle used of someone fighting a battle with fear. I want you to understand this was not easy for Jesus. It's not easy for you either. And he would pray a prayer that still rocks me. He would say, with all this sorrow, as he was feeling like death was overwhelming him, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. If there's any way, if there's any other way to save Vicky, if there's any other way for him, let the cup pass from me. But as he continued to contend with his flesh, he cried out and said, not my will. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Thank God for that prayer that shook the world and changed our, our destiny to align with God's purpose because he could have quit. He could have stopped the weight on him. Judas, who had sold him out and negotiated the, the deal, at least on Tuesday, they probably say. Now Judas, the one who was his accountant, his friend, his disciple, will come into that garden and betray him with a kiss. There's nothing worse than somebody that you love. You can get over the people that really haven't got a part of your heart, but someone that you love, someone you've supped with, someone you've been with, when they betray you, it hurts. Come on, and it's hard to hold on to hope when you're hurting. Psalm 55, Jesus said through the writer, had it been an enemy, 
I could have bore it. But it was my friend, my equal, my guide, my acquaintance that betrayed me. When the one that he saw that ate with him, that had been with him the last three and a half years, saw the miracles, heard the teaching, was the one that betrayed him with a kiss. The pressure of a friend forsaking him crushed him. Jesus is now under extreme pressure, suffering from hemidrosis. His heart is hurting. If you've ever really been broken by someone where your heart just rips out, that's not a pain that you get over easily. It's a wound that is deep. He's in a garden of Gethsemane. He's, he's pressed and now he comes and he's arrested by vile men, evil men. They take him to the high priest Caiaphas because it had to be Caiaphas because he was a high priest. He had to order it because Jesus was not just a murderer. Jesus was a sinless offerer. Jesus was an offering and a sacrifice unto God for our sin. The high priest had to ordain it. The high priest had to say it. The high priest had to acknowledge it. They stood all night long. You know what happens now? Listening to accusation after accusation. Prophesy! Who is it that smote thee? He's at the point of death. He's got hemidrosis, broken heart. Now he's dehydrated and hungry. And the Bible says a lamb that is dumb before his shears. He's led, a guard takes and hits him with the first blow. Blow after blow, they begin to beat him. The Bible says an entire band, 600 men would spit on him. He'd have human spit saliva from the top of his head down to the sole of his feet. And then the Bible says he would be scourged and crucified. According to the law, one was not to be scourged and crucified. Hold it right there. But when he gets scourged, it is the most brutal thing you'll ever hear of. You see, the Persians started all this crucifixion, but the Romans then perfected it. His body, his rib cage, his arteries would be ripped and torn apart. There's nothing pretty about the cross, the old rugged cross where our Lord and Savior would endure and bear our shame, bear our guilt, bear our punishment. When he's scourged, they take this stick that's approximately 12 to 14 inches, one inch thick. It had nine stripes of leather that ended with either bone, metal, or glass. They would take that down and they would take that stick, the most husky soldiers, and they would begin to beat our Lord and Savior. They would hit his back. They would hit his thighs, his stomach. They would raise the victim up so his toes barely touched the ground. They would dip that leather strip and with metal and bone in a bucket of salt water to make it sting where he was cut. Simple mathematics tell us that nine stripes with four bone and metal, that nine times four is 36 and that when he was beaten 39 times 39 times 36 is a possible 1,404 wounds that every time every time they took that flagrum down every time they beat him every time they yelled out prophesy save yourself Every time that he was wounded, he was wounded for our transgressions, which means a revolt, national, moral, religious. He was, it means rebellion and sin. He was taking the punishment for my rebellion. He was taking the punishment for my sin that separated me from a holy God. He was wounded for my transgression, for my trespasses, my violations, my transgressions, which means I'd gone beyond the mark. He was wounded for my transgression. He was bruised for my iniquity. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. It was a physical healing. It was a spiritual healing. It was a soulless healing. Every time that flagrum went down, don't let anybody deceive you. Cancer had to leave your body. Sugar diabetes had to leave your body. Migraine headaches had to leave your body. He is a healer. He heals you. He heals you. He heals you. Your wounds, come on, a bloody, beaten pulp of a man, a savior that came, would take this kind. He would endure this beating for you from me it's brutal and we don't like to look at it but God I felt said show it again we forget we make it so pretty Pastor Todd there's nothing pretty about this Isaiah 
tells us that he was despised and rejected of men. And we hid our faces from him because we didn't esteem him. To esteem means to value. We didn't value that. The things that we call valuable, stupid houses, cars, jewelry, clothes. We can't see value if it hits us in our face. That a man would be willing to die for us. Not as good people. As sinners. As rebels. As murders, slanders, gossipers, whores addicts, abusers. Stay there for a minute. Feel the weight of this. And you just casually come in and think you give God your hour on Sunday. He gave me everything. He gave me everything. Remember how lost you were. Remember how dark it was. They mock him, they put a purple robe on him. His arteries are cut on his back. The robe is pressing into him. They put a crown of thorns with 72 thorns on his head, about an inch and a quarter long, and they press it in just to be cruel. That crown was on his head so your head could be whole. They put on those leather gloves, they pressed it in and they give him a golden scepter, mocking him. I mean a, a dry reed, mocking him. The one who held the golden scepter now holds a dry reed. The one who stepped out on nothing and created everything. The only thing they could find him guilty of was the king of the Jews. Hail the king of the Jews. They make him carry his own cross about 110 pounds. And there's a point where he's going down the Via Della Rosa and he stumbles. Historians record this man by Simon Serene, who was out of the country of North Africa. A historian quoted him after he'd picked up the cross saying, and this is what Simon said, I didn't know him. I was just part of the crowd. I felt the weight of the cross until I saw the look in his eyes and touched his hand. Then I could no longer feel the weight of the cross. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, fell and stumbled. He could have called 10,000 angels, a myriad. He could have called millions of angels. But he kept going for the joy that was set for you, for me. He'd be crucified, he's beaten. They put this cross, which is more like a small T, not a capital T. Husky soldiers, I think I got that right, it's reverse. Husky soldiers stretch his arms on the beam. The arm is of course considered, or the hand is considered from the tip of your fingers to your elbow. They would drive those spikes through his hands through his wrist. You ever hit your funny bone? Think about what this feels like. It hit the median nerve like liquid fire. The cross would be raised, falling to the notch on the stipes. And this weight of his body would be sagging on the nails. Romans had perfected this harsh, cruel death by making the victim suffer just a little bit longer. They would nail his feet as well. Persians would let it hang. <sighs> Think about it, 9 a.m. he arrives at Golgotha. Hemidrosis, dehydration. Broken heart, beaten to a pulp. And now Jesus is on the cross and he says seven last sayings. His feet are nailed, it's hard to breathe. <gasps> Just six days earlier. Five days earlier, that Monday. 
the disciples were at Bethany having dinner, hanging out. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's mocked, he's scoffed, he's railed at. They take his belongings, they part them. If you're really the son of God, prove it. Come down off the cross. He turns my faith to the penitent thief with all that is in him. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. You see right there, that's gonna mess up so many of your theological things and I don't have the time to talk about it. But wait a minute, we better get St. Peter in front of this thief to find out, did he do the confession of faith in Romans chapter 10, verse nine and 10? Did he come to an altar? Does he know justification and sanctification by faith in God? Because we put all our boxes on why you can't get to heaven and God's torn all those stupid boxes off of why you can get to heaven. God loves you. God loves you. Church may have hurt you, but God loves you. You might have had a hard life, but God loves you. He tears down every box that somebody wants to put on you. And with one breath, he says, I'll see you today in paradise. And not a theologian on this earth, an apologetic, they'll sit around and have all their elephant rooms, can explain to you how this man is not with God. He's with him. And so are those who just remember me, remember me, remember me. Sitting there high, remember me. See, so you think you get all cleaned up. You're gonna have struggles the rest of your life. But with every struggle, he's gonna be there. With every disappointment, he's gonna be there. With every time you fall, he's gonna pick you up. With every embarrassing moment, he's gonna wipe you off. With all your shame and guilt and condemnation and rejection and everything else, he's gonna say, I didn't do this for perfect people. The physician didn't come for those that are well. He came for those that are are sick stand up on your feet he takes his last breath well I like this one I like this one because I'm a mama Brad was helping me stuff the eggs for the kids last night thank you or actually he was doing it all study <laughs> thank you I'm a mama he turns over God cares about your family listen to this I didn't come from a perfect family. I had three dads. Yeah, I had to count them and remember. I think I did. None of them were there. He looks down at his mom, Mary. And he looks at his disciple. Behold thy mother. A new family I'm giving you right here. I'm not going to be here. Take care of her. He's dying, Dr. Legrand. He's beaten. And he still understands and cares about us taking care of each other. He draws one last breath and he says, It is finished. Everybody's scattered, everybody's ran. Jesus is dead. And all hope is gone. Maybe he wasn't the one. There's not a crusade happening at his tomb. There's only a few women standing there. Roman soldiers take him off the cross. They lay him in this borrowed tomb. It's a dark day. Like many of you have had, not quite like that, but you've had some dark days. 
like I've had. But it's not the end. And maybe you came to church today because it was Easter Sunday or there's gonna be 40,000 plus eggs. But I came to church today to tell you that no matter if you've had a long dark day, you're in a dark day, or you'll have a dark day coming, I promise you this is the message. It's not the end. It's not the end. It feels like it, but it's not the end. It hurts, but it's not the end. I came to tell you that hope has arrived, real hope, not just that wishing thing, real hope that you know that you know. When you mess up, you still know. When you're hurting, you still know. When you're struggling, you still know. When you fall down, when the church wants to kick you to the curb, you still know. You might not think I'm ministry material, but He sure does. You might not think I'm worthy, but He sure does. You might think because I'm a woman, I can't preach but he sure does you might think that I'm not even worthy of your prayers but he sure does I came to let you know real hope gives you a confidence on the inside that God has you it's dark but it's not the end it was only the beginning and in this last three minutes grab the person's hand next to you and stretch across the aisle and they'll give me memos while you're not supposed to hold hands, but I'll ignore them. Because I think sometimes we need touch. This isn't a social media church. You need to remember the impact of somebody's hand holding yours. Because when he died, his body was in that tomb. But he descended to hell. He held a three day revival. He set the captives free. Revelation 118 says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys to hell and death. He has the keys. I know you can get into all the different theological, but I'm telling you what, Jesus conquered death, Jesus conquered the grave, and Jesus conquered hell. And he now holds the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And I believe he set the captives free, and I believe his love reaches you. I believe his mercy reaches you. I believe that God is after you today. On the third day, that stone was rolled away. And Luke 24, 5, 6 says, why are you seeking the dead among the living? He is not a dead God. God, this is your hope today. Then why do you seek to live among dead things? You don't have to go back and live among dead things because he is alive, because he got up. You can have life and you can get up. He is not here, but he is risen. Come on, which means to waken, to lift up, to rise again. Pastor Todd quoted it in Romans 8, 11, says that the spirit of him that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwell in you. He that raised Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. I just came with one last sentence for you. To the young girl wanting to take her life, he is risen. It's not over. Get up because of resurrection life. You see, he should have never got up. He should have stayed dead. He should have stayed down. But when he got up, he was saying, you can get up. Paula, you can get up out of your father's suicide. You can get up out of generational curse of suicide. You can get up out of depression. You can get up out of hurt. You can get up out of poverty. You can get up out of everything that the enemy has come to yoke you with. It's over in the name of Jesus. First Peter 1, 3 said, we been born again into a life of hope through Christ rising from the dead because he raised from the dead that's a whole crux of our Christianity it means I now have hope and hope makes me get up every single time hope says this isn't working against me it's working for me the basis of everything that I would reach for is contained in the fact that Jesus got up from the dead he should have stayed dead but the same spirit that raised Christ now dwells on the inside side of you talk to me talk to me mama talk to me because he is risen 
Tell the enemy it's over. It's not over. It's not over. Squeeze that hand. Look at somebody say it's not over. To the mama who lost her child. It's not over. To the father who feels shame right now. It's not over. To the marriage that is broken up. It's not over. To the business person who has lost everything. It's not over. To the young man who is struggling with his identity. It is not over. To the failed dream. It is not over. Come on to the fallen. It is not over. To the broken heart. It is not over. I came to tell you in the name which is above every name. The name of Jesus Christ. Let power be preached into you right now. Let strength be released into you right now. Let stamina come back to you right now. Let life come to you right now in the name of Jesus. You would say, Pastor Paula, I need this resurrection life. It's only one way to it. I gave it to you. He is the way, the truth, the life. If you're here and you'd say, Pastor Paula, and here's the word. Oh. Pastor Paula, if I died right now, I'm not even sure heaven would be my home. I need to walk out of here with real hope. I've got serious problems I'm facing. And I need God to move in my life. Keep that hand you're going to be an evangelist for me right now if that's you and you'd say if I died I'm not even sure heaven would be my home or maybe you've received Jesus Christ before but you've just walked away from him and done your own thing I want to come home I want to come back I want to come to God today's your day on the count of three I want you to lift your hand or just squeeze the person's hand they'll lift it for you just squeeze the person's hand say I need to be forgiven one I need to know heaven's my home I need to be forgiven Two, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Three, I need to get saved. Lift your hand, hands everywhere. God bless you, hands everywhere. There's about a hundred hands up right now. Come down, I want every one of you to come to this altar. Every one of you, get out. Come running, come on. I want to ask every pastor, every minister, come running. Every one of you that lifted your hand, come bring that person whose hand was by you. Literally half this congregation. We come up to the altar all the time. You see, Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, he said, if you deny me, I'll deny you. But if this is your first time, listen, making a, a confession, making an announcement, that Jesus Christ is Lord I receive him I want him come on all in the middle turn to your neighbor say can I walk down with you ask that person say do you need Jesus Christ come on come all the way over come on down bring them on down pastor Brad bring them on down hug on them love on them there's more come on there's more there's more church you can do better than this ask somebody say can I walk you down to the altar can, can I can I help you take that first step it's the best step of your life come on it's the most profound step of your life I want everyone else to find somebody and turn around and say can I pray for you right now find somebody you're seated next to say what can I believe God for do me a favor listen to me right now you might know Jesus is your Savior but if you would say pastor Paula I still need some victory because him getting up gave you victory how many of you need victory standing out there how many of you need victory see those hands up turn around and start praying for someone while I pray for these you're gonna pray for them if you're watching right now and you've not made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior I'm giving you an invitation remember just say Jesus I need you I want you I want you to look up here I want everybody to look up I want you to look up look up I want you to do something look far over your right shoulder look far over your left shoulder that's the last time you're ever going to look back it's the last time you're ever going to look back see you might feel something really great or you might not today but i'm going to tell you what's going to happen the moment you got out of your seat and you took a step you just made a change in your life you got what we call born again because resurrection power gives you new life it says behold old things have passed away and all things become new in christ now let me explain that real quick if you could smoke a joint yesterday you can still smoke a joint tomorrow doesn't mean everything's going to change but it means you changed on the inside and the more you start following this man jesus i highly recommend you make this your church pastor brad's a rocking pastor he's phenomenal I'm not too bad myself. You've got a great staff here. 
I ask that you get in the Bible. If you don't have one, we'll get you one. We'll teach you what this says, because this is your victory book. This is your map. This is, this is everything. And then you've got to pray, which just means talk to God. So when you get home tonight, go, hey, you know what you're gonna say? Hey, yo, God, what's up? He's gonna say, cool, come here. I can still fist bump, I'm kind of cool. I'm an old lady, I'm a grandma. Come here, give me a hug. Son, it's a good day for you. 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 You guys get around this young man. You ready to pray this prayer? Saying goodbye to the past. Say bye to it. It's over. Come on, wave it by. Wave it by. Ready? Let's pray. Say, Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Forgive me for all my sin. Holy Spirit, fill me and baptize me. That I may have power to serve God until I see him face to face. Say, devil, let go of my life. I receive Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. Now, devil, let go of their life. In the name of Jesus, I secure their life, their purpose, their calling. I secure them on the basis of the blood of Jesus. They are now marked in covenant with you. I pray that they do not return to ways that the enemy would have an advantage. But today, you favor them. Put new people in their life. Begin to bless them. Open doors that they can't even imagine, God. And I pray that this new life begins to spring up on the inside. That you show up in their dreams and their visions. That you begin to speak to them. That they'll know your voice and they won't follow another God plant them if it is your will in this church for the harvest is great but the labors are few make them mighty disciples and give us wisdom to work as a family and to do life together to serve you well and to advance your kingdom in Jesus mighty name and everybody said amen I want you to do something we're gonna take you right over to this room I've got a big gift for you they're gonna give you this gift and then we're gonna go outside guys and the helicopter is gonna come a little after 12 so everyone else do you have victory look at somebody say I've got the victory look at somebody give them a fist bump say God is good you win because he won are you ready throw up your hands say this benediction together Jeremiah 29 11 I know the thoughts that I think towards you say it the Lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end God bless you and thank you for coming if this is your first time meet right here on the side if this is if you're you're a new convert we've got the new converts I'm gonna ask you to go this way I'm gonna ask you to go this way through this door you're gonna come back in our green room I've got a nice gift for you everybody else get out on the field we've got family pictures we'll meet you right back there God bless you